Good day everyone. Welcome to our lesson number 6, which is entitled Control of Microbial Growth. So for this lesson, we are going to tackle physical and chemical methods of uh, microbial growth. So on all the surfaces in our homes and even our own skin lives an entire microscopic world. Microbes or microscopic organisms are versatile living things that colonize every surface of the planet. Many of these microbes are our friends, breaking down waste, helping us digest our food and keeping us safe from disease causing organisms. Other microorganisms, however, are pathogenic, meaning they cause disease. These microbes try to take uh, over our body and steal resources from our own cells, which makes us sick. Thus, although not all microbes are bad, so microbial control is definitely necessary for human health. Microbial control is the process of destroying unwanted microbes. Microbial control has improved throughout human history. And today, many countries have clean drinking water, sterilized food, and medical equipment. But with something so small and numerous as microbes, how can we actually ever get rid of them? Now let's find out on this uh, lecture. The learning outcomes for this lesson are the following. So to differentiate the terms related to microbial control, explain concepts, principles, and significance of infection control. Next is to determine the different bacteriostatic and bactericidal agents. We also have to identify the physical and chemical methods of sterilization and disinfection with emphasis on temperature, time, principles, mechanism involved, when to use, and advantages and disadvantages. And lastly, we have to determine the level of resistance of different microorganisms. Millennia before animalcules were viewed by Sir Anton van Leeuwenhoek and before the germ theory of disease and Koch postulates had been accepted, References to germicidal agents had been made in the ancient writings of the Egyptians. To their embalmers applied spices, vegetable oils, and gums to their dead, using techniques that have kept them in a superior state of preservation even today. Persians, Greeks, and Romans had legal documents requesting the use of bright copper and silver vessels for the storage of public drinking water. Ignaz Semmelweis, in the year 1847, at the Maternity Clinic of Vienna's General Hospital, requested that interns who had performed autopsies wash their hands with chlorinated lime before examining expectant mothers. After hand washing procedures had been instituted, the incidence of death due to post-delivery infection fell to about 1%. And Joseph Lister instituted aseptical surgical techniques by the use of carbolic acid on surgeons' hands, and then the operating field, the surgical instruments used, and the hospital environment in general. Protective surgical gloves were developed to protect both patients and surgeons, which greatly reduced infection during and after surgical procedures. Now, let's define some terms. So let's start with sterilization. Sterilization occurs when all forms of microbial life, including the most resistant forms, the bacterial endospores and prions, are eliminated. So items to be sterilized, items to be sterilized can be surfaces, equipment, foods, medications, as well as biological culture media. And then sterilization can be achieved by applications of heat, pressure, chemicals, and then irradiation or filtration. And extreme heat is the most common method used to kill microorganisms. Unfortunately for the food industry, temperatures used to kill all living microbes will also result in degrading the quality of food during the canning process. Instead, commercial sterilization is used which applies just enough heat to destroy the endospores of Clostridium botulinum, which is an organism capable of producing a toxin deadly to humans. Next, we have disinfection. It is the destruction of vegetative microorganisms by a chemical or physical methods. Disinfection does not destroy bacterial endospores and can be achieved by chemicals. Ultraviolet radiation, boiling water, or steam. Usually, the term disinfection is used when inert substances or surfaces are treated chemically and any disinfection of living tissue is called antisepsis and the uh, chemical used is an antiseptic. So the germination is the mechanical removing of most of the microbes in a limited area. An example of the germining is the cleaning of skin with alcohol before receiving an injection. Medical instruments require sterilization but in other areas of life, microbes do not have to be completely eliminated. Uh, just reduced in sufficient numbers to prevent infection, disease, and the transmission of infection and disease. Sanitation is a process that uh, intends to lower microbial counts to safe public health levels and therefore minimize the chances of disease transmission between users. 
For example, sanitation is used for glassware and other tableware in restaurants, institutions, as well as in the home environment. So we have sepsis. It comes from the Greek word, uh, which means for decay or putrid. And then it indicates bacterial contamination as in septic tanks for sewage treatment. And then asepsis, it is a technique in which uh, it prevents the entry of microorganisms into sterile tissues. And then aseptic techniques, uh, these are also uh, techniques in which it prevents contamination of surgical instruments, medical personnel, and the patient during surgery, and then prevent bacterial contamination in the food industry. So we have bacteriostatic agent or the term microbiostatic. It indicates that microbial growth is at a standstill, right? Or it inhibits the growth of the bacteria, but it does not necessarily kill them. So the suffix stasis, it means to stop or steady. And then therefore, a bacteriostatic agent prevents further bacterial growth and fungi static agents inhibit fungal growth. We also have the term germicide. It is an agent that kills certain microorganisms. Then bactericide is an agent that kills bacteria. Most uh, do not kill in those pores. We have virucide, an agent that inactivates viruses. Fungicide, an agent that kills fungi. Then sporicide is an agent that kills bacterial endospores or fungal spores. Microbial death is the permanent loss of the reproductive ability of microbes, as well as the permanent loss of all other vital activities. Lethal agents do not always alter the appearance of a microbial cell, even if the motility of the organism is gone. Therefore, the term microbial death can be used only if reproduction cannot occur, even if the organism is given the optimal growth conditions. So the destructive forces of chemical or physical agents act on the individual cells and if exposed intensively and long enough, the cell structures become dysfunctional and the cells show irreversible damage. In general, cells in a given culture or in a given environment vary in their susceptibility to antimicrobial agents, so depending on their level of metabolic activity. Young, rapidly dividing cells have the tendency to die more rapidly than older, less active cells. When microorganisms are killed by any method of control, they have the tendency to display exponential death curves. In other words, so they die at some fractional rate per unit time. So let's say, for example, if 50% of, mic of microorganisms in a population die every minute, so after 2 minutes, 25% will still be alive. And then after 3 minutes, 12.5% are still alive, and so on. It is therefore safe to say that the total number of organisms present when the disinfection process began determines the time required to eliminate all microbes. So that is the rate of your microbial death. Next, we have several factors uh, that influence the number of are influence the effectiveness of antimicrobial treatment rather. First, we have the number of microorganisms, so which dictates the amount of time required for the destruction of all contaminants. And then we also have the nature of the organisms to be destroyed. So biofilms, for example, include a number of different organisms and species. And then we also have other contaminants can include vegetative organisms as well as spores. And any target population that contain more, contains more than one organism can present a broad spectrum of resistance. So the presence of other materials or organic materials such as uh, blood, feces, saliva, they tend to inhibit antimicrobials you know, or pH and then uh, etc. And lastly, we also have the time of exposure. So chemical antimicrobials and radiation treatments are more effective at longer times. Please take note of that. And in heat treatments, longer exposure compensates for the lower temperatures. Next, we have the order of resistance against biocidal process. Contamination with microbes is a concern in many environments, industrial, home, and healthcare, to name a few. So the adequate control of these contaminants is necessary to avoid infections and disease. Although physical and chemical methods of control are available, the resistance of microbes to these methods of control varies greatly, depending on the type of microbe as well as the life stage the microorganism is in. So the resistance ranges from the least resistant organisms to those with the highest resistance. So as you can see, the highly resistant microorganisms are prions. An example of that is your uh, Creutzfeldt jacob disease or the CJD. We also have the BSE and the Serapi or the Serapi. And then the least resistant 
uh, organisms are the envelope viruses such as your HIV, HEPA B virus, and your herpes uh, simplex virus. Next, after knowing all of those, let's discuss the physical methods of microbial growth. So the optimal growth of most microorganisms depends on the most favorable environment conditions for each species. Most grow uh, best in a narrow range of temperature and then pH, osmotic uh, pressure, and atmospheric conditions. So for example, uh, obligate anaerobic bacteria will uh, be killed instantly by exposure to oxygen. If the nature of the contaminant is known, the best agent of control can be determined rather easily and selectively. However, under most circumstances, the exact nature of the microbe is unknown and rather stringent methods of decontamination will have to be employed. So humans use a lot of methods to destroy microbes such as physical methods of microbial control which can involve using heat, radiation, filtration, uh, low temperature or changes in desiccation to destroy microbes. Physical methods are in contrast to chemical methods which uses uh, chemical reactions for disinfection. Next, uh, we have moist heat under the physical methods of microbial control. So moist heat is generally more effective than dry heat for killing microorganisms because uh, of its ability to penetrate microbial cells. Uh, moist heat Moist heat kills microorganisms by denaturing their proteins, uh, which causes the proteins and enzymes to lose their three-dimensional functional shape. And then it also, uh, it also may melt lipids in cytoplasmic membranes. And then boiling water, 100 degrees Celsius uh, heating will generally kill vegetative cells after about 10 minutes of exposure. However, certain viruses such as the hepatitis virus may survive exposure to boiling water for up to 30 minutes. And then we also have your Clostridium and Bacillus species may survive even hours of boiling. So these are the different types of autoclave. You have the pressure cooker type, the vertical autoclave, horizontal autoclave, large automatic hospital autoclave, common laboratory autoclave. So autoclaving employs steam under pressure, that's the principle. Water normally boils at 100 degrees Celsius, however, when put under pressure, water boils at a higher temperature. During autoclaving, uh, the materials to be sterilized are placed under 15 pounds per square inch of pressure in a pressure cooker type of apparatus. When placed under 15 pounds of pressure, the boiling point uh, of water is raised to 121 degrees Celsius, in which it is a temperature sufficient to kill bacterial endospores. So next, we also have your pasteurization under moist heat. So pasteurization is the mild heating of milk and uh, other materials to kill particular spoilage organisms or pathogens. It does not, however, kill all microorganisms. So the milk is usually pasteurized by heating to 72 degrees Celsius for at least uh, 15 minutes, uh, for 15 seconds rather. So that's for uh, in the flash method or in the high temperature short time pasteurization or the HTST and 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes in the classic method and 140 degrees Celsius for 3 seconds using the UHT or the ultra high temperature pasteurization. Next we also have dry heat after moist heat. So dry heat kills microorganisms through a process of protein oxidation rather than protein coagulation. So one example of using this dry heat method is the direct flaming in which you have already performed on your uh, laboratory activity. So direct flaming is used to sterilize inoculating loops and as well as your wire needles. And then the heat metal, you are going to heat the metal until it has a red glow or somehow a red orange glow. Next, we also have incineration. So incinerators are used to destroy disposable or expandable materials by burning. So we also sterilize our inoculating loops by incineration. Next, we also have our hot air sterilization. So microbiological ovens uh, employ very high dry temperatures. So we have 170 degrees Celsius for 2 hours or longer, or 121 degrees Celsius for 16 hours or longer, depending on the volume. So they are generally used uh, only for sterilizing glasswares and then metal instruments and other inert materials like oils and powders that are not 
damaged by excessive uh, temperature. So as you can see in the picture, those are your microbiological ovens and uh, inside uh, are the glassware that needs to be sterilized. Next, we also have filtration under also under physical methods. So we have the microbiological membrane filters. They provide a useful way of sterilizing materials such as vaccines, antibiotic solutions, animal sera, enzyme solutions, and other solutions that may be damaged or denatured by high temperatures or chemical agents. The filters contain pores uh, small enough to prevent the passage of microbes but large enough to allow the organism free fluid to pass through. Then the liquid is then collected in a sterile flask. So just like uh, what you are seeing in the picture at the uh, right portion of the presentation. Next, we also have the HEPA or the High Efficiency Particulate Air Filters. So it is a type of a pleated uh, mechanical air filter. So this type of air filter can theoretically remove at least 99.97% of dust, pollen, mold, bacteria, and any airborne particles with a size of 0.3 microns. So please take note of that. And then the diameter specification of 0.3 microns uh, responds to the worst case. So the most penetrating particle size or the MPPS. And then particles that are larger or smaller are trapped with even higher efficiency using the worst case particle size results in the worst case efficiency rating. So such as 99.97% or better for all particle sizes. Next, uh, we also have membrane filters. So membrane filters have a known uniform porosity of a predetermined size. It's generally 0.45 micrometers. So they are sufficiently small to trap microorganisms. So using the membrane filter technique through the uh, membrane, using a filter funnel and a vacuum system, any organisms uh, in the sample are concentrated on the surface of the membrane. So the membrane with its Trap bacteria is then placed in a special plate containing a pad saturated with the appropriate medium. So the passage of nutrients through the filter during incubation facilitates the growth of organisms in the form of colonies on the upper surface of the membrane. And then discrete colonies thus formed can be easily transferred to the confirmation media. Now let's proceed to the low temperature under physical methods. So let low temperature inhibits microbial growth by slowing down the microbial metabolism. So examples include uh, refrigeration and freezing. So in refrigeration at 7 degrees Celsius, it slows the growth of microorganism and keeps the food fresh for a few days. Okay, uh, It reduces the metabolic rate of most microbes so they cannot reproduce or produce toxins which is harmful to us humans. Uh, freezing at uh, negative 10 degrees Celsius stops microbial growth but generally does not kill microorganisms and keeps also our food fresh for several months. So flash freezing it does not kill most uh, microbes. Another type of freezing is the slow freezing which is more harmful than flash freezing because ice crystals will disrupt the morphology or the cell structure of our microorganisms. Next, we have the desiccation method. So desiccation or drying generally has a static effect on microorganisms. Lack of water inhibits the action of microbial enzymes. And then dehydrated and freeze-dried foods, for example, do not require refrigeration because the absence of water inhibits microbial growth. So there are also uh, microorganisms that can uh, survive under desiccation. So we have Neisseria gonorrhea. They survive about uh, one hour. MTB may survive for several months. Then viruses, they are resistant to desiccation. And Clostridium species and Bacillus species, they can survive up to how many decades? So next, we have osmotic pressure. So microorganisms in their natural environments are constantly faced with alterations in osmotic pressure. Water tends to flow through semi-permeable membranes, such as the cytoplasmic membrane of microorganisms, towards the side with a higher concentration of the salt materials or the solute. In other, in other words, uh, water moves from greater water, uh, water concentration to a lesser water concentration. Okay? So from lower solute to a greater solute. If the concentration of the salt materials or solute is higher outside of the cell than the inside, so then the cell is in a hypertonic environment. So under this condition, the water flows out of the cell, resulting in shrinkage of the cytoplasmic membrane or 
thus the term plasmolysis. Okay? So under such conditions, uh, the cell becomes dehydrated and its growth is inhibited. And then we also have the uh, yeast and molds, which are more resistant to high osmotic pressure. And we also have our Staphylococci species. They live on our skin and they are fairly resistant to high osmotic pressures. The ultraviolet portion of the light spectrum uh, includes all radiations with wavelengths from 100 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So as you can see in the picture on our presentation, these are the different forms of uh, radiation. So the microbicidal activity of the UV light depends on the length of exposure. So the longer the exposure, the greater the uh, sidal activity. And it also depends on the wavelength of UV used. But the most uh, sidal wavelengths of UV light lie in the 260 nanometers to 270 nanometers range where it is absorbed by the nucleic acid of our microorganisms. Next, we also have the uh, ionizing radiation such as your gamma rays, uh, x-rays. So they have uh, much more energy and penetrating power than your UV radiation. So ionizing radiation from the word itself, so it ionizes the water and other molecules to form radicals Radicals are somewhat uh, molecular fragments with unpaired electrons that can disrupt DNA molecules and proteins. So it is often used to uh, sterilize pharmaceuticals and disposable medical supplies such as the syringes, surgical gloves, catheters, sutures, and petri plates. So it can also be used to retard spoilage in seafoods, meats, poultry, and as well as fruits. So in terms of its mode of action, UV light is absorbed by the microbial DNA and causes adjacent uh, thymine bases on the same DNA strand to covalently bond together, forming what are called uh, the thymine-thymine dimers. Okay? So as the DNA replicates, the nucleotides do not complementary base, with, uh, do not complementary base pair with uh, the thymine dimers, and then this terminates the replication of that DNA strand. However, most of the damage from the UV radiation actually comes from the cell trying to repair the damage to the DNA by a process called uh, SOS repair. So in very heavily damaged DNA containing large numbers of thymine dimers, a process called SOS repair is activated as a kind of a last-ditch uh, effort in order to repair the DNA. So in this process, a gene product of the SOS system binds to DNA polymerase, allowing it to synthesize uh, new DNA across the damaged DNA. Next, the last uh, radiation type method is our microwave radiation. So the wavelength ranges from 1 millimeter to 1 meter and then the heat is absorbed by water molecules and then microwave radiation may kill vegetative cells in moist foods. But uh, please take note of this, bacterial endospores which do not contain water are not damaged by microwave radiation and solid foods are unevenly penetrated by uh, microwaves. Next, let's proceed to the chemical methods of microbial growth or microbial control. Chemical agents are generally not intended to achieve sterilization. So most reduce the microbial populations to safe, lab uh, safe levels and then remove pathogens from objects. An ideal disinfectant or antiseptic or an ideal chemical agent kills microorganisms in the shortest possible time without damaging the material treated. So among the crit important uh, criteria for selecting an antiseptic or disinfectant, are the concentration of disinfectant to be used, whether the agent is bactericidal or bacteriostatic. So the nature of the material to be treated, whether organic matter will be present, the temperature and the pH at which the chemical agent will be used, and the time available in which the chemical agent will be left in contact with the surface tested. So phenol derivatives, called phenolics, contain altered molecules of phenol uh, useful as antiseptics and disinfectants. So the phenolics damage the cell membranes and inactivate enzymes of microorganisms while denaturing their proteins. So that's the mechanism of the phenolics. And then examples of phenolics uh, include cresols such as lysol and then as well as several bisphenols uh, such as our hexachlorophene. And then we also have our, uh, yung hexachlorophene is, the, is particularly effective against our staphylococci or the staphylococcal species. So advantages, so they are stable and then persist for long times after applied and they remain active in the presence of organic compounds. Next, among the halogen antiseptics and disinfectants are 
uh, chlorine and iodine. So iodine is used as a tincture of iodine, which is an alcohol solution. Combinations of iodine and organic molecules are called iodophores. So they include betadine and isodine. So both of which contain a surface active agent called povidone. So iodine combines with microbial proteins and inhibits their function. So that's the mechanism of our iodine. Next, we also have our uh, chlorine, which also combines with microbial proteins. And it is also used as a sodium hypochlorite or bleach. And bleach is uh, used mostly for disinfecting uh, in the household or in the laboratories. And then as calcium hypochlorite, so chlorine is available to disinfect equipment in dairies, slaughterhouses, and restaurants. So we also have chloramines or chloramines. So chloramines contain chlorine together with ammonia. And then they are used to sanitize glassware and uh, eating utensils and are effective in the presence of organic matter. But they are less effective as germicides. And then chlorine is also used as a gas to maintain a low microbial count in drinking water. Alcohols. So alcohols are used, uh, useful chemical agents when employed against bacteria and fungi. But uh, they have no effect on bacterial spores. So the type of alcohol most widely used is 70% ethyl alcohol, ethyl alcohol or ethanol. And then isopropyl alcohol or the commonly known as the rubbing alcohol is also useful antiseptic and disinfectant. Because alcohols evaporate quickly, they leave no residue and are useful in deserming the skin before injections. And isopropanol is cheaper and less volatile than our ethanol. So a number of heavy metals have antimicrobial ability. For example, silver is used as a silver nitrate in the eyes of newborns to guard against infection by Neisseria gonorrhea. And it is also used to cauterize wounds and then copper is uh, used as a copper sulfate in order to retard the growth of algae in swimming pools, uh, fish tanks, and as well as in reservoir. And then mercury, uh, specifically organic mercury, like your mertiolate and mercurochrome, they are used to disinfect uh, skin wounds. So next we have our zinc. Uh, zinc is useful as a zinc chloride. So in mouthwashes and as a zinc oxide, it is used as an antifungal agent, uh, which is found in paints. And then the heavy metals are believed to act by binding with sulfhydryl groups on the cellular proteins. So that's the mechanism of our zinc. And then we also have arsilinium. So they kill, it kills the fungi and their spores. And they are also used in uh, anti-dandruff shampoos, such as that you can see on our uh, presentation. Next, we also have our quats or the quaternary ammonium compounds. So they are widely used surface active agents. So they are cationic or positively charged detergents. And they are effective against gram-positive bacteria. But they are less effective against gram-negative bacteria. So their function is that they destroy fungi, amoebas, and envelope viruses. So please take note of zephyran and then cephacol. They are also found in the lab spray bottles. So advantages of using our quats is that they have a strong antimicrobial action. They are colorless, odorless, tasteless, stable, and non-toxic. Uh, but on the other hand, the disadvantages are the following. So it forms a foam, and then the organic matter, when present, it interferes with uh, the effectiveness of quats. And then quats can be neutralized by soaps and our anionic detergents. Now, there are two aldehydes, so the formaldehyde and the glutaraldehyde. So both inactivate microbial proteins by cross-linking the functional groups in the proteins. So that's the mechanism of the two aldehydes. So let's proceed to the formaldehyde gas. It is, a commonly, used, uh, it is commonly used as a formalin. And then a 37% solution of formaldehyde gas is also commonly used. So it is widely employed for uh, embalming purposes. And disadvantage of using this one our formaldehyde gas or formalin is that it irritates the mucous membranes and it has a very strong odor. The next one is the glutaraldehyde in which it is used as a liquid to sterilize hospital equipment. However, uh, several hours are required to destroy bacterial spores. So it is also used no, in mortuaries for embalming our glutaraldehyde. And glutaraldehyde can be used in uh, two different ways. So glutaraldehyde can be bactericidal, tuberculocidal, and virucidal in 10 minutes. And it can be uh, sporicidal in mechanism. 
if you are going to expose the material for 3 to 10 hours. So it depends on the mechanism or the exposure of the material to glutaraldehyde. So sterilization can, achieve, uh, can be achieved with a chemical known as our ethylene oxide. So this chemical denatures proteins and destroys or my, all microorganisms, including bacterial spores or endospores. It is used at a warm temperature in an ethylene oxide chamber. So several hours are needed for exposure and flushing out the gas, which can be toxic to humans. And then ethylene oxide is widely used for plastic instruments such as petri dishes, syringes, and artificial heart valves. So ethylene oxide can also be written as uh, capital E, capital T, and capital O. Okay, so ethylene oxide. And this uh, gas is a highly penetrating gas. Okay, so that's for our ethylene oxide. Next, uh, we also have our ozone. Ozone can be used to disinfect water where it oxidizes the cellular components of the contaminating microbes. So how are we going to... Uh, Get sterilized using ozone, you are going to expose the oxygen to electricity or UV light in order to form this ozone. Okay, So ozone is just a highly reactive form of our oxygen. But one of the disadvantages of uh, using ozone is that it is more expensive than the ethylene oxide. Uh, next, we have our hydrogen peroxide. So oxidizing agents such as hydrogen peroxide kill microorganisms by releasing large amounts of oxygen which contributes to the alteration of microbial enzymes. Hydrogen peroxide is uh, useful on inanimate objects and in foods, but on the skin surface. So it is quickly broken down by the enzyme, catalase, and then liberating oxygen. So this oxygen causes a wound uh, to bubble and thereby removes microorganisms present. However, the chemical activity on the skin is limited compared to that on inanimate surfaces. Contact lenses can be disinfected with our hydrogen peroxide, but benzoyl peroxide is applied to the skin in order to treat acne due to an aerobic bacteria. So the oxygen released by the compound inhibits an aerobic growth. Okay, so please take note that uh, our 3% hydrogen peroxide uh, is used for uh, in some tests in microbiology and as well as in various concentrations. Okay. Next, we have our peracetic acid. Peracetic acid is one of the most effective uh, liquid sporicides available nowadays. So as a sterilant, so it can kill bacteria and fungi in less than 5 minutes. And then it can also kill endospores and viruses within 30 minutes. So your peracetic acid is used widely in the disinfection of food and medical instruments because it does not leave uh, toxic residues than the other uh, peroxygens class or than the other oxidizing agents. Alright, so this uh, chart or this photo shows the efficiency of different chemical antimicrobial agents. A comparison of the effectiveness of various antiseptics, so it is already plotted in our uh, graph there. So the steeper the downward slope of the killing curve, so the more effective the antiseptic is. Therefore, a 1% iodine in a 70% ethanol solution is the most uh, effective and then soap and water are the least Effective. So notice that a tincture of zephyran is more effective than an aqueous solution of the same antiseptic. So that is how you are going to interpret the efficiency of the different chemical antimicrobial agents. And these are the different references used for this uh, lesson. And thank you so much for listening. I hope that you had learned something. And if you did not somehow understand the lesson, you can just uh, replay and watch the video again. And once again, thank you so much class. Have a good day and God bless you all.